Planning and Land Use Com Management Committee of the Los Angeles City Council's regular meeting. September 6th, uh, we're joined by uh, the CLA and the person of Mr. Mejia, the city clerk in the person of Ms. Rosales and the city attorney in the person of Ms. Corisani. We also have uh, members of the committee present and the leader of our Department of City Planning, uh, the one and only Vince Bertoni. Can you begin our proceedings, Mr. Mejia, by calling the roll? Mr. Mejia? Let's go, Bears. <laughs> Cal Bears. All right, uh, I'll call the roll. Uh, <laughs> Chairperson, Mark Luis Harris Dawson, President. Uh, uh, Vice Chair of the Committee, Mr. Bob Blumenfield. You got no sound, Mr. Mejia, no sound? You can't hear me? More, more. You're on mute, that, if that helps. All right, uh, Mr. Uh, John Lee. Present. Mr. Gil Cedillo. Present. And uh, Ms. Ron Monica Rodriguez. Absent. Uh, that gives us three members and a quorum. Um, hello? Hello? Me? You're there. Yeah, we're trying to get you to... Hello? Yes. Hello? We call the roll, we, we call the roll on your behalf. <laughs> what? <laughs> no, I can't. We can hear you fine. We can hear him fine, whoever's talking to Mr. Mejia. We can hear what he's saying fine. All right, we're gonna to try to press on. Um, we'll start this meeting by taking public comment on agenda items. Our goal is to get to as many speakers as possible. After that, we'll move through the agenda one item at a time, hear staff presentations and any other testimony that's pertinent to the item, and then we'll vote on them uh, accordingly. Uh, I'll ask uh, the clerk, Ms. Rosales, to read the uh, rules for public comment into the record. And I'll note that the uh, vice chair of the committee, Mr. Bob Blumenfield, has joined us. Thank you, Mr. Chair. M members of the public who would like to offer public comment on the items listed on the agenda should call 1-669-254-5252 and use meeting ID number 1616446631. And then press pound. Press pound again when prompted for participant ID. Once admitted into the meeting, press star nine to request to speak. During public comment, city staff will call on members of the public by the last four digits of their phone number. By pressing star nine, callers raise their virtual hand to request to speak. Once the caller hears the last four digits of their phone number, an automated Zoom voice will ask the caller to press star six to unmute themselves when it is their turn to speak. Once the caller is ready to speak, they must state their name and the items they are calling to speak on. Failure to do so will result in the call being muted and subsequently disconnected. Appellants and or the representatives and applicants and or the representatives will be allowed to speak for a total of three minutes per side, unless otherwise noted by the chair. Members of the public wishing to speak on one agenda item only shall have an opportunity to speak for one minute. Appellants and applicants will be given an opportunity to speak when their item is called. 
Each appellant and applicant has a total of three minutes to speak. An appellant can choose to have a single representative speak on his or her behalf or divide the three minutes among his or her team. Anyone else, including an attorney or project manager wishing, wishing to speak on an appellant's behalf who does not do so during their three minute period may offer a minute of public comment whenever the committee chairperson opens the public comment period for the meeting, which is usually at the beginning of the meeting. Therefore, we expect that appellants and applicants have their respective teams assembled and ready to present at the appropriate times today. Members of the public wishing to speak on more than one item shall state that and shall be allowed to speak for a total of two minutes. Failure to raise your hand to speak in a timely manner before the comment period for the item ends results in forfeiture of the opportunity to participate in public comment for the item. City Attorney, please provide additional guidance on public comment. Adrian Corisani, City Attorney's Office. When speaking on the agenda items, you must be on topic. Our goal is to get through as many speakers as we can. If you are not speaking on topic, or if we cannot tell whether you are speaking on an agenda item, you will receive one brief warning. If you do not immediately and clearly return to the topic, or if you continue to stray off topic and disrupt the meeting, you will forfeit the rest of your time and we will move on to the next speaker. You will be informed when your time is up. And Mr. Chair, um, I was wondering if you were going to uh, call for any changes uh, to items prior to the um, public comment period being open? Yes, uh, we're gonna ask that, uh... I, uh, there's been a request to continue item number eight uh, until September 20, 2022. And that's the only one I know of at this moment. I think there might be some uh, proposed changes that the um, planners or staff might need to read. Yeah, we're, we're prepared to hear amendments to any items at this time. So if those come from the planning department or any of the council offices, uh, we're, we uh, would want to hear those before we go to public comment. So now would be the time. Thank you. Councilmember Harris Dawson, this is Craig Bullock with CD13 and we have an item amendment for number four. Okay, you want to read it into the record? Yes, thank you. Um, I'd like to convey the council member's support for making the Hollywood Home Savings and Loan a historic cultural monument with a slight modification to the recommendation made by the Cultural Heritage Commission. This modification was memorialized in a letter with an attached map to the Plum Committee, which was uploaded to the council file last week. The modification seeks to exclude the surface parking lot. The surface parking lot was not identified as a character defining feature by the denominator, Hollywood Heritage, nor was the surface parking lot identified as a character defining feature by Architectural Resources Group, the expert historian preservation consultant retained by J.P. Morgan Chase, the property owner. It is for these reasons that we ask for your consideration in excluding the surface parking lot from this historic cultural monument. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Bullock. Uh, Ms. Che from Department of City Planning, do you have uh, items? Yes, uh, good afternoon, Jane Choi, for the record. For item number five, council file number 22-0023, staff would like to highlight the revised findings submitted to the council file and dated March 4th, 2022, which incorporates technical modifications for the committee's consideration. Thank you, we have any other amendments or changes? All right, hearing none, we'll go to public comment. Caller with the number ending in 5909, please press star six to unmute yourself and state your name and which items you're speaking on. Hello, my name is Gabriella and I'm speaking on number nine. Um, I live in the area and I'm really excited for this project to be built. The city really needs more affordable homes and this project is allocating 10 out of the 86 units to be affordable. Homelessness has never been worse and this developer is doing their part to address the housing crisis. On top of that, this project will make the area of Sunset more walkable by adding commercial businesses on the ground. I really support this project 
And um, I also have a lot of single and newly married friends right now, and they really need places to live, and they all want to live in Silver Lake. Um, so I really think that this project would be great for them. Um, thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Caller with a number ending in 6626, please press star 6 to unmute yourself. Caller with a number ending in 6626, please press star 6 to unmute yourself. Caller with the number ending in 1136, please press star 6 to unmute yourself. Caller with the number ending in 1136, please press star 6 to unmute yourself. Caller with the number ending in 9163, please press star 6 to unmute yourself. Yeah. Caller with the number ending in 9163, please press star 6 to unmute yourself. Caller with a number ending in 5065. Please state your name and which item <coughs> you're speaking on. I think. Uh, Hi. Uh, oh, my name is. Hello? Yes. For, please proceed. Can you hear me? Hi, uh, my name is Donald Harlan. I'm here in Los Angeles. I, I made some comments for uh, agenda items number four, five, six, and eight. Um, I was looking at some of these properties. Uh, I'm not sure about seven. I haven't had as much time to look at it, but uh, I think number seven is also bad. Uh, okay, uh, first of all, agenda item number four, uh, naming the bank there at the corner in Hollywood, uh, a historical monument, uh, that's definitely a no. Uh, they shouldn't be naming that bank a historical monument. It has a, that bank has a, lot, a long, dark history of people getting murdered in the area and then having their businesses and their money taking, taken from them after they're dead and people living in their lives after they're gone through that bank. That bank has a long, dark history of that. I would contact JP Morgan and inform them that you guys are trying to make it a historical monument. I'm sure they're keeping track of people like that. Agenda item number five. Uh, 1524 Northwestern Avenue. Uh, definitely there's a problem with the uh, 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 properties over there. Uh, a person, a uh, real estate developer by the name of Eric Lieberman uh, is over there uh, illegally developing properties. What he's doing is he's, re he's a, a real estate lawyer who's rearranging addresses to try and change the parcel identification. You know, saying it's on one street when it's not really on another. Uh, and uh, he's got all kinds of funny development around that block. Most of that is my property or what's my family's property. I have a bad feeling that what they're doing there is illegal. Their development at, around and on 1524 Northwestern Avenue. 
it shows up that in uh, 1991 to 1995 that there was a lot of real estate fraud around that time from the same people that are named in the property ownership at 1524 to 1530 North Thank Western you, Speaker. Avenue. That's your time. Caller with the number ending in 0520, please state your name and which item you're speaking on. Hi, right, council members. It's uh, Stephen Resnick from the Westwood Neighborhood Council regarding item eight. If, if uh, pardon me if I didn't hear correctly, if that's been continued, I'll reserve my marks, remarks uh, uh, when it comes up on the agenda again. Can you confirm that it's been continued and won't be heard th today? That is the case. Okay, thank you very much. Pardon the interruption. Caller with the number ending in 2542, please state your name and which item you're speaking on. Good afternoon. My name is Zachary Card, and I'm speaking in regards to agenda number nine. I work in the Silver Lake area. Uh, I give my strong support to this much needed uh, housing project. As we all know, in the city of Los Angeles, we have a housing crisis and a homeless crisis. This will br bring much needed housing uh, to the area. It's a beautifully designed building. It's gonna replace uh, a, a single level auto body shop, in my opinion, and others uh, as a visual, currently a visual blight to the area. Uh, it will definitely improve the walkability along this stretch of Sunset Boulevard uh, and provide uh, the addition of much needed um, you know, retail businesses on the street. So I give my strong endorsement for it and I kindly ask that you please vote to approve it. Caller with the number ending in 1781, please press star six to unmute yourself. Hi, uh, my name is Ara. I work in the Silver Lake area, um, and I'm calling about uh, item number nine. Uh, I walk by this site every day, uh, and uh, we really need amenities along that street right now. It's a big eyesore to have uh, that auto body shop there. Um, their flatbeds pretty, pretty much block one lane on Sunset regularly. Um, and I really think that this, uh, this uh, project is exactly where it needs to be. We really need to activate that street. Uh, we, you know, we, a lot more people are, are moving to the area and want to work in the area and uh, be close to their work. And I think that this, uh, this project is in the perfect uh, location for that. So I really support it and I hope that you will as well. I hope you vote to uh, uphold this approval. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Caller with the number ending in 8239, please state your name and which item you're speaking on. Hi, my name is Hiro Kobayashi and I'm speaking on agenda number nine. Uh, this is regarding the project at 3225 Sunset. Uh, currently it is an auto body shop uh, and the developer it has a long history of building successful projects. Um, and this new project, which is a total of 86 units, with 10 affordable units would be a great addition to the neighborhood. Uh, this would activate the Sunset Boulevard corridor, and these are the type of areas where a density bonus project should be built. Um, I think it will improve the safety and walkability of the stretch of Sunset by adding new businesses, and we think that this type of investment would be good for the future of Silver Lake. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Speaker. Caller with the number ending in 7046, please state your name and which items you're speaking on. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, my name is Casey Madrin. I'd like to speak on items five and nine. 
Um, item 5, 153 on Northwestern, I'd like to speak in support, in support of the appeal. The applicant has received several entitlements to allow 60-foot tall hotel uh, next to a low-scale apartment. But the specific plan limits the project height to 25 feet, not 60 feet. And the LA Municipal Code prohibits a hotel use within 500 feet of an R zone. There has been no noise study conducted, and so there's no way of imposing mitigation measures um, to address the fact that the project has no side rear or front, side back, front yard setbacks. Uh, meaning that there's a good chance the neighborhood will be impacted by noise, which is a growing uh, problem with many of the hotels in the city is approved in uh, close proximity to residential uses. Um, also, just as we're emerging from a deadly pandemic, the city must not approve projects that combine residential uses with transient occupancy uses. This places tenants at increased risk by inf of infection by forcing them to share spaces with travelers from other parts of the world. On item nine, again, I'm speaking in support of the appeal, um, 3209 Sunset. The applicant's representative asserts that the property is not truly in a very high fire severity zone uh, based on an consultant hired by the developer. To focus on the facts, Zima shows that the project does indeed lie within a very high fire severity hazard zone. The LAFD, pursuant to California law, has designated the site as a very high fire hazard severity zone. Then also, the project does not qualify for a categorical exemption pursuant to CEQA. And the fact is that the project is not consistent with all applicable, applicable zoning designations and regulations. The applicant has requested three off-menu incentives to allow 100% decreases in required residential and community parking, in addition to more than doubling the allowed FAR. The applicant has also requested five waivers of development standards, clearly a project that involves significant reductions in required parking, approximately doubling allowed height and FAR, reduction of required setbacks to zero, and a 24% reduction in required open space is not consistent with the applicable zoning designation and re regulations. Therefore, the project cannot be considered uh, exempt from CEQA. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Speaker. Caller, please state your name and which items you're speaking on. Good afternoon. I'm a stakeholder, general public comment. Yes, one person's treasure is another one's, I'm sorry, one person's trash is another person's treasure, or in this case, one developer's construction waste is a person experiencing homelessness, PEH, new encampment material. Of course, a development project is not going to object to a PEH removing material from their dumpsters. They're removing it for free. Developing construction projects need to better secure their trash because this or this material should be given to those projects such as tiny homes. I, as a resident of the city of Los Angeles, am sick and tired of seeing temporary fencing, two by fours and plywood being used by PEH to create outdoor dwellings. Thank you. Thank you, speaker. Caller with the number ending in 8559, please press star 6 to unmute yourself and state your name and which items you're speaking on. Hi, my name is Lorena Toom. I'm calling to speak on item number 9. Um, I work in Silver Lake. I think the project would be great for the area. Um, it's a fantastic replacement to the auto body shop that's currently there. It addresses um, our need for more housing, including low-income housing. Um, it's also going to add some liveliness to that stretch of Sunset Boulevard, which is fairly quiet. The design is beautiful. Um, it will activate the area also with new retail and restaurants. And more housing in general um, increases inventory, which translates in more affordable rents, which is very, very needed here. I support the project, and I ask you all to please vote to approve it. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Caller with the number ending in 8619, please state your name and which items you're speaking on. Hello, my name is Carol Citroni. I'm also a Silver Lake resident. I just love all of these memes and all of these um, automatic responses from the people that have been given their marching orders. Um, uh, as repeatedly stated in the appeals, according to LA Municipal Code Section 1222A, 
the Stansity bonus project with all of its approved menu items and CUP allowances and waivers is simply not allowed in any area designated as a very high fire severity zone. There's a reason for this, for public safety and well-being. By approving this illegal project, the city has failed to recognize the negative cumulative impacts that these excessive incentives will bring and seem to care more about Sacramento mandates and developers' bottom line than the safety and quality of life of the families that actually live here. A complete environmental impact report must be required, the project redesigned to ensure the safety and well-being of our community and the environment. Thank you. Caller with the number ending in 1920, please press star six to mute yourself and state your name and which item you're speaking on. Hi, my name is Eric. I'm a stakeholder and, and work in the Silver Lake area, and I'm calling on item number nine. Uh, calling to issue my support to the housing development at 3225 West Sunset. Uh, projects like this that chip away at the housing shortage here in LA, especially in areas with proximity to jobs and transit. Uh, and there's heavy demand for more businesses in the area. Uh, projects like this create more walkability in what is a, an underutilized French sunset. And I think this new development is aesthetically pleasing and will contribute to the streetscape. Um, this is exactly the type of development we need in LA and I please ask you to vote to approve it. Thank you. Caller with the number ending in 6836, please state your name and which item you're speaking on. Um, hello, my name is Estevan. I'm calling regarding item number five. I'm basically concerned about the noise issues and so an earlier caller mentioned that there may not have been a uh, study on the noise impact and also the uh, sort of environmental impact um, uh, regarding particles in the air. There's a lot of uh, apartments near here and so I'm just concerned about the windows facing it and whether or not it would uh, reduce the air quality and the sort of noise we would have to deal with. Caller with the number ending in 5087, please press star six to unmute yourself. Yes, hello, this is Brian Curran, president of Hollywood Heritage and applicant for item number four. Hollywood Heritage appreciates the Plum Committee's consideration today of the HCM nomination for the Hollywood Home Savings and Loan, the current case bank at the corner of Sunset and Vine. A masterpiece of Miller Cheeson associated with the Los Angeles family of the Amundsen. Um, Hollywood Heritage had the uh, had the opportunity to work with the council office, Chase Bank, and the representatives at Architectural Resources Group. Um, and like both of them, uh, we encourage the committee to approve this nomination today. Uh, we also um, are encourage uh, the the inclusion of our uh, character defining features for the interiors, which included the skylight the double height uh, for, um, atrium, uh, as well as the axial placement of the, of the entrances, and finally, the uh, Squaw Man mural of 1970. Uh, these are integral to the, uh, to the historic uh, significance of the building. They are um, typical of the Amundsen banks uh, of, that were done for the, the Home Savings and Loan Company, um, and, uh, and it came out of the Miller Street Studio. So we uh, encourage the, uh, the the count the committee to pass this with um all of those character defining uh thank you speaker that's your time thank you caller with the number ending in 0203 please state your name and which items you're speaking on thank you david wheatley w-h-e-a-t-l-e-y speaking on item nine Thank you for the opportunity to speak on this, calling to uh, support the appeal, uh, which will hopefully uh, curtail this project way back. It's way too big for Silver Lake. 
Also, I'd like to request that the people who are calling in uh, in support of the project, um, that we need to find out from them if they need to be registered lobbyists, if they're accepting anything of value uh, for being here today. Also, uh, I'm the co-chair of the Urban Design and Preservation Advisory Committee in Silver Lake, so speaking as an individual today. And uh, this appeal has considerable merits. This uh, needs to have an environmental review. It's not exempt. As uh, stated by the applicant, uh, there are too many cumulative projects around. The effect on the environment is going to be severe, especially in terms of traffic, and the people in the environment are going to be adversely affected by it as well. Thank you, Speaker. So That's your time. Request that you support the appeal. Thank you. Caller with the number ending in 5065, please press star six to unmute yourself. Caller with the number ending in 5065, please press star six to unmute yourself. Hi, right, this is Doc. Hi, this is Donald Harlan in Los Angeles again. Thank you very much. I, I need to mention about agenda items number five, six, seven, and eight. Uh, the address to, uh, number five is 1525 Northwestern Avenue. Uh, that there's uh, something uh, unusual about that property. Uh, they're rearranging the addresses to claim real estate next to them and uh, deleting assessor reports. Uh, they, there was a lot of that, a lot of the property it, uh, in a, in a, um, a lot of the property sales and a lot of the property uh, uh, change of ownerships around 1991 to 1995 have that kind of problem. And surprisingly not, that these names come up quite a bit in that. Uh, that's a pretty long time they've gotten away with that. Uh, agenda item number eight, 923 South Proxton Avenue. Uh, this is almost for sure um you know an illegal uh claim of the ownership of the property and the, the ownership of the property went out of sequence in 1998 uh looks like somebody else filed an accessory report for the same property there's some conflict there somebody got replaced or forced out or some illegal transaction looks like somebody got chased out or something um and agenda item number seven uh yeah this is a big problem over there in MacArthur Park. Uh, that's not too far from where I am. Uh, there's any, there's tons of illegal developments. Everybody's building low-income apartments. Supposedly they're going to be low-income, but they're not going to be. Uh, all over the place, uh, illegally. Uh, they don't have the owner of the property's permission. Uh, there's just crazy guys uh, from a construction company showing up and building things. Uh, whoever in the city is giving permits and permission for them to build on these projects that are working for the city shouldn't be protected by the city. They should go to jail for that. Thank you, Speaker. That's it's your not time. a case of them not doing their homework, but they're doing the illegal. They're committing crime. Caller with the number ending in 8990. Please state your name and which items you're speaking on. Okay, hi, my name is Molly, and I'm calling to support the appeals for number five and number nine, and also to support the historic designation uh, on number four, and thank you, thank you, Hollywood Heritage, for all the work you do. You all keep supporting projects that are out of scale with the areas, the heights are too tall for the existing communities, and they all have to live with unlivable projects because of this corruption in this city. The other thing is you keep ignoring very high fire severity zones. That's number nine, and we're in an area where the TOCs are giving 75% density bonuses in our very high fire severity zone, where only 35 is allowed. We do not care about the lives of Angelinos. We will vote all of you out. If you don't get reelected, that's why. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. 
caller with the number ending in 4462. Please state your name and which items you're speaking on. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Amalia Boli Fuentes. I'm speaking on item number 10. I'm an attorney with Lozo Drury LLP speaking on behalf of Supporters Alliance for Environmental Responsibility or SAFER. We previously submitted comments on the Sustainable Communities Environmental Assessment or SCIA to the city during the public comment period and we resubmitted them to the Plum Committee on June 6th. We're not opposed to the project, but we request that the city prepare an EIR for the project or an MND because we do not believe that the project meets requirements for using a SCIA. We've reviewed the city's response to comments and we reiterate our previous comments. We maintain that the proposed project did not implement a number of air quality and hazards and hazardous materials mitigation measures that were feasible and applicable to the project. And additionally, the SCIA is inadequate because it fails to fully address hazards and hazardous materials impacts. Lastly, the SCIA failed to provide substantial evidence to support its conclusions about air quality impacts. So for these reasons, we request that the Plum Commission reject the use of the SCIA and instead require preparation of an EIR or an MND. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Caller with the number ending in 5866, please state your name and which items you're speaking on. Hi, my name is Cindy and I'm speaking on item number nine. I've been a Silver Lake resident for my whole life. I was actually born at Hollywood Press Hospital at Sunset in Vermont. But anyway, I would like you to know that I support this project because it's beautifully designed. It will replace a very ugly, unsafe auto body shop and everyone around there knows that it's not a very safe place um, and it benefits the neighborhood. It'll improve walkability. People won't have to walk from their house through the hills down to sunset to get a bite to eat or to meet a friend. Um, and I hope that you vote to approve this project and I'd like to thank you very much. Mr. Chair, the last two speakers with their hand raised are speakers who are speaking on specific items. And so for the record, uh, they will speak when we get to their item. You mean they're appellants or applicants? They are applicants, one applicant, one appellant. Got it, okay, thank you so much. Uh, with that, uh, Mr. Mejia, are you fired up and ready to go? Fired up, sir. There you go, all right, let's, uh, let's roll with our regular agenda, item number one. Item one, uh, this is a uh, motion Wesson Harris Dawson of a council initiated community plan implementation overlay amendment and a height district change uh, for the property located at 5741 West Jefferson Boulevard and 3336 to 3348 South La Cienega Place in CD10 for the proposed redevelopment of the site as a mixed use self storage building. The recommendation is to adopt the motion, sir. Excellent. Uh, do we have a report from the Department of City Planning? <coughs> I think you're on mute, Mr. Uh, Robles. Sorry. <laughs> it's a Robles Planning Department. We will uh, look into this and accept the motion and work around it. It's a property that is uh, being uh, uh, accommodated. However, we will look at the right process to address this issue, whether it will be a comprehensive plan amendment case or a case to be filed at the DSC. So we will report back to you. All right. Uh, if there's no further discussion, I'll uh, move that we adopt. Uh, I can. Seconded by Mr. Cedillo. Uh, please call the roll, Mr. Mia. Uh, yes, Councilman Harris Dawson. Yes. Councilmember Cedillo. Yes. Council Member Blumenfield. Aye. Council Member Lee. Aye. Councilwoman Rodriguez. Aye. Oh, sorry. And that's five members unanimous, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. That takes us to item number two. Item two, this is a report from the Bureau of Engineering relative to the process to transition the LA Alfresco program into a permanent sidewalk dining rewalkable permit program. The file is also pending in Transportation and Public Works Committee. Excellent. Uh, I think we have a report from, from our Bureau of Engineering. Hello. Yes, good afternoon.
Council members, uh, Wesley Tanajiri from Bureau of Engineering. Um, our office has been working with uh, DOT on the expeditious implementation of the alfresco dining into permanent uh, permits. Um, my update is gonna be specifically regarding sidewalk dining right now. Um, in May of 2022, the Board of Public Works adopted revised sidewalk dining policies to help implement the alfresco dining. There are approximately 1,600 existing LA alfresco sidewalk dining locations. Um, our, off, our, our programmers are working on updating our revocable permit sidewalk dining application to automatically transfer the LA alfresco dining locations into the revocable permit process. The process will begin with an applicant deciding on whether to um, join the revocable permit process. There'll be a $150 fee that we are proposing, which is reduced from the original $550 tier one revocable permit for sidewalk dining fee. Some of the uh, streamlining uh, items are that we are not requiring the waiver of damages to be recorded. We're not doing site, uh, site visits and the system will automatically issue a revocable permit once they agree. And then there will be a six month grace period where they will be required to comply with um, the conditions to submit a waiver of damages, provide proof of liability insurance, and to pay their sewer facilities charge fees for uh, chair, new chairs in the public right of way. Uh, once they comply with that, then they will have their revocable permit for sidewalk dining. If they do not complete their conditions with the six months, then they will not have a permanent sidewalk dining revocable permit. Um, we are working with LADOT to incorporate the on-street dining locations to issue a local permit. And that will be a separate process with LADOT that they will review. And in the end, it will be issued a revocable permit. And that's all I have right now for the uh, sidewalk dining. I'm open for any questions that you might have. All right, members, questions or comments on this item? So, Mr. Chair, um, so we're going to be having dialogue both on two and three combined, or are you going to, because they're kind of an association? Um, yeah, we can look at them together. Uh, so let me just hold and ask Mr. Mejia to read that into the record, and then that will let us consider and discuss them and vote on them together. Uh, sure. Item three is a planning department and the Department of Building and Safety report providing a status update on the Alfresco program. All right, and so we have additional uh, input from planning department and building and safety on these items. Yes, uh, good, after good afternoon, honorable chair and committee members. Uh, Andrew Pennington with the Department of City Planning, and I'm joined by my colleagues, Mary Richardson and Hagu Solomon Carey as well as Frank Lara and Carolyn Wakala from the Department of Building and Safety. The Department of City Planning was instructed back in March of this year to create a permanent alfresco program to generally update the zoning code's outdoor dining provisions and provide a status report on some of the pressing topics related to outdoor dining. This status report is before the committee today. The current alfresco program has touched every portion of the city and is still in effect. Altogether, there have been nearly 3,000 businesses that have received a permit for alfresco dining, more than half of which have utilized their private property in some fashion for outdoor dining. The department, in collaboration with the Department of Building and Safety, drafted responses to the various items that City Council requested the departments to consider as part of any future alfresco program. Generally, the topics for the department to consider in the report include parking and mobility issues, 
alcohol permitting and noise concerns, strategies for streamlining, and coordinated enforcement. The department has investigated each topic and how it may relate to updated outdoor dining regulations and a permanent alfresco program. In terms of parking concerns, parking impacts vary from establishment to establishment, as well as block to block, depending on the density of food establishments, as well as how many food establishments are actually still participating in alfresco. Various transportation demand strategy, demand management strategies exist to better manage parking supply and to encourage different modes of transportation. Many of these strategies are listed in the proposed transportation demand management ordinance and may have applicability to a permanent alfresco program. Though there are limitations to its application for standalone <clears throat> restaurants given their small size. In terms of alcohol sales, alcohol sales are typically only permitted through a CUP or through the recently adopted restaurant beverage program. The expansion of restaurants under Alfresco will need to come into compliance with these regulations. The impact of this need for compliance is still being determined and, with, and whether any changes to the current regulations may be warranted. As for noise impacts, noise impacts and whether any regulations to minimize impacts near residential areas should be imposed are being investigated and a number of options already exist in the code and are under consideration. As for streamlining, the department is looking at a range of options for streamlining regulations and permitting. This includes ways that current outdoor dining regulations could be modernized that make any outdoor dining project more predictable and universal on a citywide basis. Finally, <clears throat> the department have outlined current strategies for enforcement and how current collaborative efforts may be replicated for this program. The departments continue to work diligently on this code amendment and look forward to releasing a draft ordinance in October for public comments. Thank you for your time and consideration and we are available for any questions the committee may have. All right, uh, we have anybody from building and safety? or other members of the planning department? Yes, good afternoon, committee members. Uh, this is Frank Lara, Department of Building and Safety, no, but I do not have anything to add at this time. All right, um, so we'll begin our discussion uh, with that and uh, we'll start with uh, Ms. Rodriguez. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, thank you for the presentation. Um, you know, one of the issues that I had raised previously, and uh, I know Vince and I have spoken about it previously, is just, uh, you know, obviously the need, we, we were in an emergency situation, we were very quick to uh, avail a lot of very public space that by and large was not really being utilized uh, to help provide some enhancements and support for the business communities that have been so devastated through the course of the pandemic. Um, as we continue to kind of reflect on how we make this more permanent, um, I just want us to really be thoughtful in terms of both the fees that are assessed um, with this. I recognize that, you know, we, we want to take care of all of these small businesses. And I'm someone who's done a lot of work with small businesses and, and on sidewalk dining before the pandemic um, to help, you know, working with very closely with BOE, for example, to really standardize standardize how we do it because it's uh, there's a lot left for interpretation given that not all of our sidewalk infrastructure is consistent across the city. So some stand to benefit more than others. Um, but I think just, the, in, and thank you, Mr. Chair, for, for having these kind of conversations um, together because I think when we reflect on the fees, we have to think about what the um, kind of the, forces are that when people are leveraging, as you mentioned, Andrew, their private property, the impacts and implications for parking. Um, and, you know, because we're basically kind of, we're still, we're, you know, we're still taking something away and we're basically still put, uh, making, uh, growing the burden on our public infrastructure, but also just in the context of the broader conversation that we just even had about a week and a half ago with respect to, um, 
our uh, safer streets initiatives and some of the infrastructure that we're going to be building out. There's, I mean, there's, it's such a difficult dynamic, right? And, I, and, and why I appreciate why it's a revocable permit. Um, but what my concern is, is, you know, I've seen certain restaurants really build out some phenomenal infrastructure, right? I can think about some locations on Fairfax and other areas um, that have uh, really built out some substantial outdoor dining. And my concern is, is that we're perhaps putting ourselves, I, just to be really thoughtful about how we do this in terms of a memorialized policy, um, with all of the investments that some of these restaurants, for example, have made, my concern is that depending on upon how much investment they made and depending on what uh, they think the longer term commitment is, um, if we start making greater investments in the Safer Streets Initiative or something like that, or DOTs or, or street services is going to, you know, resurface an area, what are we doing? How do we address those things? How do we mitigate that? But also, how to how do we assess the value of the additional real estate, public real estate, that many of these um, private entities are doing? Because we're now basically, um, you know, frankly, there's a financial benefit for the utilization of public space. So I just want to, you know, I'm just kind of throwing that out there for for you guys to kind of think about and talk about in terms of. Uh, what are some of the ways you're kind of evaluating this? Because how we value that is really critically important. And it's one thing for us to do it in the context of an emergency. It's another thing to do it long term. And, um, and you know, the streets belong to the people. And so when we have these conversations, I want to make sure that we're really being, being very reflective and thoughtful about, uh, about those pieces. Thank you, uh, Mr. Rodriguez. Do uh, any of our uh, department leaders want to comment? I mean, I'll just, well, I think that, uh, thank you, Councilman Rodriguez. I really appreciate those comments and they're very important comments. And I would say that if you followed um, this program in New York City, um, it's been a very, um, very contentious process, right? There's been a lot of, for the things that, many of the reasons that you had mentioned in terms of public spaces and public realm. and so. Um, and the Alfresco program, how it's split up is uh, engineering and transportation is handling the public spaces and planning and building is the private spaces. I've had those conversations with my counterparts in in uh, DOT and in, in Bureau uh, BOE, and I will continue to do that. I don't. I, it's it's. I think critically important is is um, about for all the. I don't need to repeat everything you said, but I think to raise some really critically important issues in terms of long emergency versus long-term for a very, very long time versus a, a short-term emergency. These are public spaces and there's a value to them and they happen. Um, these public spaces are used very differently in different parts of the city and they have different values in places. Um, so I think you're asking um, some of the most critical questions um, that we can do in this program. And I, um, and I think it's, I really appreciate you raising those. And I brought those up to DOT and transportation. I, I don't know if, if, uh, if BOE, if you'd like to, if there's anyone from transportation and BOE who would like to um, respond. Um, okay, so we'll, I, will, I will convey that to my, <laughs> to my fellow general managers very directly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you and, so much. And, and and I think, you know, the other part of events, and I don't know, because uh, I, I, you know, BOE, I appreciate, I, I know that BOE and um, DOT are part of the conversation, but even street services, when we talk about resurfacing, like I said, like is given some of the permanent structures that have been constructed that I've seen just on Fairfax alone, um, is Fairfax never going to be resurfaced, right? right? Like that, those are some of the things that we have to really think about because that's where we're going to run into problems. And, you know, I think of Third Street, I think of, there are certain streets where I've seen uh, certain like substantial investments uh, in, in building this stuff out that we just really have to be, you know, I want us to be thinking as much as possible about uh, how we might be, uh, you know, really tying, you know, tying ourselves up. Uh, and, and again, you know, I, I'm sensitive also to the um, not making it cost prohibitive, but to the extent that, you know, people start to make it 
um, start to invest in some pretty fancy outdoor dining facilities, you know, it, we end up by extension unintentionally um, making it, you know, far more costly for them as well. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you for that, Ms. Rodriguez. Mr. Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So along the lines of what Council Member Rodriguez was asking about, um, the biggest problem I think that we foresee um, is not necessarily in the front, but in the buildings in the back that took up so much parking for so many of our locations. And just wondering if anyone here can give us sort of like a an idea of how you're looking at that process uh, uh, regarding parking, because I think that's going to be our biggest issue facing this. And this is this council member uh, parking on private property, the public space or both? Uh, this is on uh, private property. Absolutely. So that I know planning and building safety have been looking into that. It's all of Arthi and her team respond to that. I think there's a lot of different things that First of all, thank you, Council Member, for the question. Um, I think when it comes to pub private parking and whether or not uh, the can we continue to allow for outdoor dining to take over required parking spots, I think that is something that we're still investigating. I'm trying to understand what the actual impacts to the neighborhood are. Uh, over the last few months, we released a survey to both the general public and to the participating businesses uh, in the Alfresco program and asked a lot of pointed questions about parking in terms of how much parking is being utilized by the restaurants on average, as well as what the feeling from the general public is on allowing some type of continuation of that program. Obviously with more constraints and with more requirements than uh, are in the current program, but uh, Overall, we have gotten some really good feedback. Uh, I'm loath to share anything specific because we're still going through the data at this time and trying to determine what other sources uh, we need to touch on related to it. Um, but that's all to say is we're continuing to investigate it, investigate what the impacts could be and how to best mitigate those impacts if there is a continued allowance for it. Uh, there and this question, um, I apologize for, uh, thank you, Andrew, for that thorough answer. The one um, kind of Nick Maricic will probably know a little bit more about the one kind of like question mark we have right now is there is a, a bill that has passed on um, the state legislature um, that's awaiting a decision by the governor, um, AB 2097, I believe, um, by Laura Friedman, that would eliminate parking um, requirements in, within a certain distance of um, transit stations um, and it would be for residential and certain commercial development. So there may be some changes in that. I don't know if Andrew or Nick has any update on that. I would have, how would it apply to this, Nick, if you have? Sure, Nick Maristich, principal planner. Um, happy, to, happy to jump in. Um, yes, and the bill, uh, as we understand, was passed by the legislature. It would apply to a half mile of major transit stops. Um, so, you know, just within those limited geographies, uh, it would apply to commercial uses and uh, override local parking requirements for commercial uses within a half mile of major transit stops which are, they are defined in state law. Um, we understand it's been sent to the governor and are awaiting a decision there. So it would not affect um, you know, all areas of the city, but it would affect those areas of the city that are um, well served by transit. Those are typically major projects, just so you have a sense of that, those are usually uh, train state stops in a rail line such as any metro rail line as well as is it two major bus lines come together yes that's correct if the intersection just... of two major bus lines with 15 minute headways in the peak hour right so some of the examples of that is, um yeah can me want to provide some examples of these by major print stop but i think it's similar to our toc definition of, of sure, very, very much so the toc map that we have uh through the city's zenith uh website gives a, a good approximation of where those areas are located uh, heavily concentrated in you know the central parts of the city, but uh, there are locations across the city as well in the valley. Yeah, in the valley. Hey, hey, Vince, I got I got a quick question for you guys on that, uh, and thank you for bringing this to my attention because we got light rail coming, yep. uh, and in my area I've got zero parking in the commercial corridor. 
uh, where it's coming. And I know there's other parts of the city that have uh, been impacted by the lack of parking. And yeah. so this kind of waiver of, uh, of having some of that, uh, what are there any, is there any room for exemption on that or it's just unilaterally applied? Great question. Um, so a few things, and Nick, and now Nick's really dug into this, and I'll let him kind of correct me if I get something wrong. A few things to keep in mind, major projects, yes, you do have the East Valley um, Light Rail Corridor, and I believe it's considered as soon as it's funded, it would fall under this, this provision. That's typically how it works, and I believe that's already been funded. So I do believe that that East Valley uh, Rail Corridor would, would fall underneath that. Um, there is a very limited provision, but I think it had to do with housing. I'm, so Nick, what, there is a there is a very narrow exception. They've crafted this exception very narrowly, and it, there's some changes at the last minute that I don't know that we've thoroughly vetted with our attorney's office to under to really understand it. But we're 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 going we're digging deeper into what that exception says. Nick, do you want to give some additional? Yeah. That's right. Uh, that's right, Vince. And uh, we are looking at, at it more closely. It did change towards the end of the legislative process and trying to better understand what those exceptions might be under certain circumstances where the city could still require parking. Um, much of that language that was negotiated, I believe, was focused on housing projects. Um, but we're still, you know, going through the fine language, fine, you know, the fine print to understand what the, the language means, particularly as it might pertain to, you know, um, uh, parking being used for other purposes and not being subject to the local parking requirements for commercial uses. Right, it's, okay. it, w it was, at the, I think it was passed last week, right? It was the very end, so it was like at the end, it was the end of the month, right? So August 31st is, I believe, was the 30th or 31st, so we're still doing some evaluation. I, I think some of the, the exceptions were more on the housing end than the commercial end of, of things, as my memory is, had to do with like if it was going to um, be impediment to housing or affordable housing production, but but we're definitely looking into that and we should hopefully have a better sense of that soon. All right, well, we'll have an offline conversation, yes. I'm sure. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Mr. Lee, um, the, the question, you have anything else? No, that's it. Thank you, Mr. Blumenfield. Great, thank you. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very bullish on, on our extent, expansion of the Alfresco program, I think it's been great so far, and I'm looking forward to how we do it. Um, you know, at the same time, I, I recognize some of the concern my co concerns my colleagues have raised about, you know, the the privatization of public space and 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 making sure that if we're allowing that and allowing, you know, the monetization of private space, a public space, how do we? How do we make sure that the public benefit is enough to warrant that? And, and there's several ways to do that. Obviously, one way is just is straight out money that can go to other things. But if you if you create too high of a fee, although I guess fee may be the wrong word in this case, because um, and I, I'm curious what your thoughts are, but because a, a fee generally has to reflect the cost of of the of the burden on the city as opposed to the bigger societal cost, you know, it's the cost of permitting versus the how you quantify the loss of of outdoor space that's previously been used for parking or for other public purposes. So I'm, that's one aspect is how do you how do you quantify, if at all, that public benefit as you do these equations? Um, I'm curious about that and 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 just and 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 also other ways, if not monetary, that we can. Uh, gain a, a a public benefit that somehow reflects the, the public loss. For example, and I'm curious how much you consider these kinds of things, you know, like requiring ex expanded cleanup, you know, like we do when we have, uh, when we permit outdoor temporary signage at, at, um, uh, at construction sites. We require that the, the owner of those signs do you know, graffiti cleanup within a certain radius. Are there things like that that can also be, that are, are less financially burdensome for the businesses, but that could be beneficial for the community that, that are part of this equation that we're thinking about? How broad have we cast our net and how are we, how are we quantifying the public benefits that are being lost? That's a pretty broad question, but. 
Well, I mean, I'll let, I can only answer the, I can answer the private side of it in terms of the private property. I'll let on the, on what's in the street right away is BOE and DOT. And I'm, if the DO, BOE representative would like to chat on that. Sure, uh, regarding uh, cleaning, um, the, one of the basic parts of the revocable permit is that <clears throat> the permittee maintain the encroachments. In this case, we have a requirement that they use private trash cans for their uh, customers' trash rather than placing them in pub public uh, trash cans. And the area has to be kept clean at all times. So that's kind of a basic part of the revocable permit for sidewalk dining. Right. So that, that's just that's just trying to keep it even. That's not trying to capture a little bit more public benefit to reflect the the, lo the loss of a public good. I, I see what you're saying. But yeah, we have not looked at like them doing street cleanup along the block or anything like that. Is that kind of where you're getting? Yeah, I, I, I'm just you know, uh, this is a new program. I'm trying to make sure that we're all thinking creatively. Uh, we want to make sure we also we don't create an un, a burden that kills you know the golden goose or something because these alfresco programs are really good so I, i'm not trying to create a big burden but i just I, I do want us as we get these reports and as we're starting to think about the actual ordinance to think creatively about other other ways to uh, capture that that public benefit sure I, I could bring that up in future discussions. And, and then um, to briefly address council member Rodriguez's uh, question about existing encroachments in the street. So I've been working with Jacqueline Garcia at LADOT and they are well aware of the existing sidewalk dining on street, you know, how elaborate some of them are. And um, we have to address resurfacing along with utility companies putting in new services. So they need to be uh, removable at some some point, some way. So they, they are aware of it and, and we are looking into those requirements and guidelines. Right. And then just my last comment is just, you know, clarity is important. I've talked to a lot of business owners who either have invested or want to invest in some more permanent type structures. And the, the biggest stumbling block is is the clarity you know and that sometimes at the city we we aren't so clear and that's that's um making a lot of businesses nervous and and uh so that's just i just put my word in for clarity as we move this forward yes yes um they're, they're aware of that as well so we're, they're trying to come up with guidelines so that you know it'll be clear on what is allowed and what what is not allowed so hopefully that'll be coming out soon Perfect. Thank you so much, Mr. Blumenfield. Mr. Cedillo. Let me speak unabashedly in favor of these initiatives to promote sidewalk dining, alfresco uh, dining. We offered a motion to move us in this direction in the summer of 2013, uh, much before the pandemic was known. I think the concerns raised are all offset by the incredible need for us to re-stimulate the economy. We are down at 63% downtown Los Angeles after the extraordinary efforts of the downtown rebound, moving 75,000 people into downtown and creating businesses where it was once blighted. In our district, we are unfamiliar with the concerns that you have raised. Uh, our expansion of Alfresco has taken place on sidewalks and in parking lots behind uh, people's uh, restaurants. Uh, I can this uh, Sabor Colombiano, La Faria, uh, restaurants on Venice and Pico, uh, who are all utilizing this, but not just in the very flavorful uh, southern part of my district, but also in Highland Park, uh, a corridor completely revitalized, a uh, corridor that uh, has uh, waited for these opportunities and took advantage of them during the pandemic, but one that we had identified early on as prime because of the wide sidewalks as a place where sidewalk dining would be solely appropriate. Uh, I'm sure it drives businesses crazy that they uh, work so hard to get permits uh, for dining uh, and then are stifled by conversations like what we've heard so far on these two items and stifled by uh, the inaction of the city to accommodate them and to make them 
uh, function and work for uh, those communities and those small businesses that provide the vitality of the city. Uh, I've uh, traveled recently and I cannot tell you how uh, familiar sidewalk dining is in other cities and I would hope that uh, it would be the same here in Los Angeles. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Cedillo. Uh, Ms. Rodriguez, I see your uh, virtual hand is still up. I don't know if that's on purpose or... Yeah, I well, I just I just wanted to ask Wesley, you indicated about the permanency of the structures and they have to be, uh, you know, non-permanent, right? Um, it has that was that part of is has that remained a an instruction as the as the uh, revocable permits are being issued? Yeah, so that'll be a part of LADOT's review process. Um, they are going to review all of the on street dining, um, and then they're still looking into the requirements and guidelines because, you know, as we mentioned. There does have to have to be street resurfacing and other install, right. installations in the public right away. So they're looking into what can and what cannot be allowed on the permanent revocable permits. Right. Okay. But has that been in terms of the emergency? The what we currently have in place versus the long term that has already been uh, instructed. Because I, I know I got calls on. <laughs> One particular location uh, previously where there was quite a build out. And so that's what I'm just trying to ascertain whether or not that was disclosed. So, um, you know, it, it is under DOT, but with my discussions with Jacqueline, um, there, there wasn't a lot of rules about the current El Fresco unless they were like blocking the sidewalk or there was a, a safety issue. Then, then they brought it up to that restaurant owner to say, hey, you know, you can't do this. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I think most of the on street were kind of under the the emergency orders. Okay, but but it was explicitly laid out that it shouldn't be uh, that it needs to be a uh, non permanent structure. Correct. Um, that I would have to check with DOT on what okay. they require. All right. Uh, so I just want I'm I'm asking the question multiple ways because we know. Uh, Sometimes do we have to, um, but I'd rather, I'd rather get that because again, this is public space. And so while we're all committed to making sure that we're um, sustaining the local businesses and you know, we've provided a great deal of relief, um, this is the property of the public. And, and I, you know, I ask the questions about parking because I have zero public parking lots in my district, not a single one. You can go up Fig, Fig's got Avenue 50, 52, 54, you've got a bunch. I got zilch. So, you know, we have to be mindful about some of the communities that have zero access to public parking. And when we create policies, we're creating it for the entire city, not district by district. So I'm just trying to be mindful of that. But thank you very much. I appreciate the conversation, guys. I know it's a, it's a very complicated with, with very, you know, with uh, such varied infrastructure across the city, it makes it very difficult uh, to create a policy like this that is unilaterally, you know, uh, uh, universally applied. So I appreciate it. I know it's tough. Thank you guys. We appreciate your work. Thank you so much, uh, members. If there's no further discussions, I want us to begin with item number two. Um, I'll move that question uh, with a special instruction and Mr. Mejia will read Second. it. Uh, it's been seconded by Mr. Cedillo. Uh, yes, for item number two, councilmen and committee members, to note and file the June 9, 2022 BOE report, in as much as the report is for informational purposes only, and two, to instruct the city administrative officer with the assistance of BOE to prepare a report with recommendations to waive fees for businesses located within the business incentive zones. Uh, for item three, which was the planning department and building and safety report on the status report of the Alfresco program. A recommendation therein is to note and file the August 5th uh, planning department and building and safety joint report in as much as it is submitted for informational purposes only. I will call the roll. Council member Harris Dawson. Yes. Council member Cedillo. Yes. Council member Blumenfield. 
Aye. Council Member Lee. Aye. And Councilwoman Rodriguez. Aye. That's uh, five members in unanimous, Mr. Chair. Excellent, that takes us to item number four. Item four, this is a categorical exception from CEQA and a report from the Cultural Heritage Commission relative to the inclusion of Hollywood Home Savings and Loan as a historic cultural monument situated in CD13. Excellent, uh, so we'll begin this discussion with a report from uh, Department of City Planning. It looks like we have Ms. Ryan on the line for this session. Uh, Melissa Jones will actually present this item for us. Okay. Uh, yes, good afternoon, Chairman harris Austin, and members of the committee. I'm Melissa Jones with the City Planning's Office of Historic Resources. Before you today is the recommendation from the Cultural Heritage Commission to designate the Hollywood Home Savings and Loan located on the corner of Vine Street and Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood as an historic culture monument. The subject property is a 1967 two-story commercial building designed in the new formalist architectural style by artist and architectural designer Millard Sheets. The Culture Heritage Commission found that the subject property embodies the distinctive characteristics of a style, type, period, or method of construction as an excellent and intact example of new formalist architecture and represents a notable work of a master designer, builder, or architect whose individual genius influenced his or her age as an example of a building and mosaic by notice, noted artist and designer Millard Sheets. This concludes my report and Shannon and Ryan from our office and I are available for any questions. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, do we have a representative from uh, the owner? JP Morgan Chase, it looks like. Not, do we have, uh, Mr. Bullock has spoken on this already. If you have anything to add from Council District 13? I do not. Excellent. All right, uh, I'll move that uh, we approve this inclusion. Uh, if there's a second. second. Second by Mr. Cedillo uh, and Mr. Mejia, can you please read specific instructions and call the roll? Uh, yes, to approve the inclusion of the Hollywood Home Savings and Loan uh, located at 1500 through 1518 North Vine Street. It's been moved and seconded. Council members, Adrian Corsani, City Attorney's Office. I hope I'm not looking at the wrong item. I think this one was um, the one that um, Mr. Bullock um, asked to amend to not include the surface parking lot. Um, so I just want to make sure that that's clear in the action that the commission, that the committee takes if that's what you um, decide to do. Thank you so much, Yeah, the, the intention is to move this as amended. It's clear, clear to me as well. I, I, I will call. I will call the roll. Uh, Council Member Harris Dawson. Yes. Council Member Cedillo. Yes. Council Member Blumenfield. Blumenfield, aye. Council Member Lee. Aye. Councilwoman Rodriguez. Aye. Uh, five members and unanimous. Thank you so much. That takes us to item number five. Item five is a mitigated negative deck, uh, the CEQA findings, uh, and a report from the Central Area Planning Commission. Uh, revised findings and an appeal by Doug Haynes, who's challenging the um, construction of a new mixed use uh, project situated in CD13. Uh, All right, uh, we'll have a report by uh, Los Angeles City Planning. Yes, good afternoon. I'm Jane Choi with the Planning Department for the record. The project before the committee is located at 1530 North Northwestern Avenue and associated addresses and consists of the demolition of an existing duplex and a surface parking lot for the construction of a new mixed use building with a 36 guest room hotel and, um, and 10 residential apartment units. At its meeting on October 26, 2021, the Central APC adopted a mitigated negative declaration for the project and approved the requested entitlements, including conditional uses for um, a hotel use within 500 feet of a residential zone property as well as for alcohol and a project permit compliance and specific plan exception from the Vermont Western Station neighborhood areas plan specific plan. On December 27, 2021, an appeal was filed of the ABC's entire decision um, by an aggrieved party. The appellant um, alleges that the project does not comply with the specific plan and that the commission erred in approving the specific plan exceptions. Um, planning staff submitted an appeal response as well as the previously mentioned revised findings with technical modifications. Both documents are in the council file and dated March 4th, 2022. 
In addition, all potential environmental impacts were studied and disclosed in the mitigated negative declaration, including any noise impacts and mitigations were included. Um, and the comments by the speaker did not identify any new substantial evidence or impacts that were not previously studied or disclosed. Staff recommends the committee deny the appeal and sustain the decision of the central APC with the revised finding. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, now we'll hear from our appellant, Mr. Haynes. Doug Haynes, please press star six to unmute yourself. Hello, hi, this is Doug Haynes. First, I want to point out that I did try to speak during general public comment on item number nine. So I want to submit into the record before my time begins on this that I object to the project and support the appeal. Also, I want to point out that I submitted a letter today into the file for your consideration stating further objections to this proposed project. I hope you have an opportunity to be doing. Second, the city has granted the applicant generous entitlements to allow a 60 foot tall hotel to be constructed immediately next to existing residential apartment buildings with no required front side or rear yard setbacks. No ambient noise analysis was conducted, so no realistic noise and vibration mitigation measures have been proposed or required to effectively address construction or operational impacts, planning staff's reference, the mitigation measures is merely the city's um, basic standard guidelines. It's not a mitigation measure proposal. The city further provides no examples where the exceptions to the specific plan that have been granted to the applicant are necessary for the preservation and enjoyment of a substantial property right or use generally possessed by other properties in the same zone of vicinity. I wish to point out that in 2015, the city denied several SNAP exception requests in the conditional use permit for another proposed hotel development at 5600 Hollywood Boulevard, three blocks northwest of the proposed Harold Lloyd project. Those entitlement requests included a waiver of the height limitation, as is in the case of the project for you today. As stated by the city in denying that project, however, quote, the requested specific plan exceptions are not necessary to make the site developable. The requested specific plan exceptions appear to make an already developable site more developable. The site is afforded the same development rights as all adjacent parcels of land. The exceptions are not necessary for the preservation of a property right that is possessed by adjacent properties, but denied in this case. Unquote. The same logic applies to the current project. Also in 2014, the courts determined that the city's grant of a height exception in addition to multiple other exceptions to a target store one block south of the site were illegal. As stated by the court, quote, the height restriction codified in the SNAP presumably expressed the community's standard for public welfare with respect to commercial building height at the time when SNAP was adopted. Nothing in the evidence that is identified to support the finding suggests that a building that exceeds by double the SNAP height requirement is in furtherance of public welfare or is not injurious to nearby properties. The exception for target for law will become a precedent used by other applications throughout SNAP to apply for height and bulk exceptions for commercial development, unquote. The city claims that special circumstances include that the specific plan, quote, as per the city, did not take into consideration non-traditional mixed-use building made up of hotel use and residential units, unquote. Yet there's no proof or examples by the city to support this claim and no explanation for how it would be relevant even if it were true. The city further contends that the applicant's expansion of the hotel into his existing surface parking lot and the adjacent parcel creates an L-shaped design of the lot as stated by staff, and that this unusual design as described by staff is an exceptional circumstance. Such claims are nonsense, particularly because it is the applicant himself who has created the lot configuration and therefore any hardship is entirely self-imposed. That's the conclusion of my arguments Basically, this project is not allowed by SNAP. It's far out of scale with SNAP, and it's also not allowed. The CUP restricts hotel developments within 500 feet of a residential zone. The CUP grants to waive that request, that, excuse me, that restriction is illegal as well. Thank you very much, and I hope you will uphold my appeal and deny the project. Thank you so much. Uh, now we'll hear from the applicant or representative. 
For the record, Mr. Chair, we did give Mr. Haynes an extra one minute for public comment due to him not speaking during uh, the allotted time. So noted. Eric Lieberman, please press star six to unmute yourself. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Honorable Chair Harris Dawson and members of the committee. My name is Eric Lieberman from QES Incorporated. I represent the applicant and the owner of the proposed project, Phil and Mina Patel. Uh, the Sapphire Hotel, located at 1524 through 1530 Northwestern Avenue, as well as 5446 Herald Way, is a family owned and operated community-based hotel and residences designed to serve the local area with a boutique hotel and accommodations along with apartments. The project has a unique opportunity to provide both needed housing with 10 apartment units, including two affordable units and 36 hotel guest rooms as a mixed use building. This is a vital location with easy access to Hollywood Boulevard, just a few blocks north. The project contributes to the ongoing focus of the revitalization of Western Avenue and the Hollywood community. The project received unanimous approval from the Central Area Planning Commission, and uh, we would ask that the Planning and Land Use Management Committee uphold the Area Planning Commission's approval and deny the appeal before you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Do we have any uh, input from Mr. Bullock, CD13? CD Good afternoon. This is Craig Bullock with Council Member Mitchell Farrell's office. The council office concurs with the Department of City Planning staff report and that the appeal should be denied. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, so I'll move the denial of this appeal by Mr. Haynes with specific instructions. Uh, Mr. Mia, if you could read those into the record, then we'll get a second and uh, call for the vote. Uh, yes, to deny the appeal filed by Doug Haynes from the La Mirada Neighborhood Association, thereby sustain the Central Area Planning Commission's approval of the construction of a new mixed-use boutique hotel with 36 guest rooms, 10 residential apartment units, two units as affordable, one very low-income unit, one low-income unit for a period of 55 years, and 47 parking spaces, and the four land use entitlements, the specific like plan exceptions, the conditional use for the hotel, Our the conditional use for that. alcohol, and the project permit compliance for the property located at 1524 through 1530 Northwestern Avenue and 5446 West Harrell Way in CD13, and as stated on the record by CD13 by Mr. Bullock. I will call the roll. Council Member Harris Dawson. Yes. Council Member Cedillo. Council Member Cedillo. Council Member Blumenfield. Blumenfield, aye. Council Cedillo, member, yes. Thank you, sir. Council Member Lee. Aye. Councilwoman Rodriguez. Aye. That's five members and unanimous, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much. Uh, that takes us to item number six. Item six is a categorical exception from CEQA related findings and a report from the Central Area Planning Commission and an appeal filed by Enrique Velasquez from the Coalition for an Equitable Westlake MacArthur Park from the Central Area Planning Commission's determination in approving the categorical exemption for a transit oriented communities project. It includes uh, multifamily development with 92 dwelling units, 11 units for extremely low income households. For the property located at 603, 603 and a half and 605 South Mariposa Avenue in CD, in CD 10. All right. Um... I understand that this appeal has been withdrawn, but we'll start with a report from the Department of City Planning. Good afternoon, Council Members. Sophia Kim with City Planning. We have prepared responses to the CEQA appeal. Um, to stay for the record, the appellant submitted a letter to withdraw the appeal. Thank you. Uh, all right, if there are no comments uh, from the appellant or applicant, uh, I'll move that we deny the appeal, which has been withdrawn. The specific instructions, um, we'll read those into the record and get a second and call for the vote. 
Uh, yes, to deny the appeal filed by Enrique Velasquez of the Coalition for an Equitable West Lake MacArthur Park, thereby sustain the Planning Department's determination to approve the environmental clearance, categorical exception for CEQA, for a transit-oriented community project for the construction of a multifamily development with 92 dwelling units, 11 units for extremely low-income households, for the property located at 603, 603 and a half, and 605 South Mariposa Avenue in CD10, and we'll call the road. Council Member Harris Dawson. Yes. Council Member Cedillo. Yes. Council Member Blumenfield. Aye. Council Member Lee. Aye. Councilwoman Rodriguez. Aye. Five members and unanimous, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much. The Texas item number seven. Item seven is categorical assumption for CEQA related findings, a report from the planning department and appeal by Enrique Velasquez, again from the coalition for equitable Westlake MacArthur Park. This is a transit oriented communities project with 16 dwelling units, six dwelling units for extremely low income households um, for a period of 55 years. Property is located at 1037 South Dewey Avenue um, in CD10. All right, uh, we'll hear from uh, city planning. Good afternoon, council members. Michelle Carter with city planning. Before you this afternoon is a sequel appeal of a class 32 categorical exemption. The project is located at 1031 to 1043 South Dewey Avenue in the Wilshire Community Plan area in council district 10. The proposed project is a TOC project that involves the construction of a new six story residential building with 60 dwelling units, including six units reserved for extremely low income households. On June 23rd, the planning department issued a director's determination approving the TOC project and the class 32 categorical exemption. An appeal was subsequently filed by the coalition for, for an equitable Westlake MacArthur Park the main appeal point raised is related to cumulative impacts. The appellant contends that there will be significant cumulative impacts because of past, current, or future projects within a 0.6 mile radius. The appellant does not state which cumulative effects are at issue. As detailed in the letter staff provided to the Plum Committee dated September 1st, 2022, which can be found in the council file, the appellant has not presented new substantial evidence to the record showing that the department erred in its decision relative to the categorical exemption. That said, the planning department recommends that the Plum Committee recommend for a step council action to deny the appeal and determine that the project qualifies for a class 32 categorical exemption. That concludes my presentation. We're available for any questions. Thank you so much. Uh, now we'll hear from our uh, appellant. Enrique Velasquez, please press star six to unmute yourself. Oh, hi, good afternoon. Uh, this is Enrique Velasquez. And essentially, I just like to uh, reiterate uh, what the, uh, the planner in charge of this case uh, just mentioned to you guys. Um, again, like many other projects that we have appealed, uh, we are just concerned about the cumulative impact in the community by all of these projects that you guys keep just rubber stamping without really considering that the community, the uh, cumulative impact is basically the displacement, the gentrification taking place uh, in the area. There is no uh, study of the traffic, the limited resources that we have in the city of LA. Now with this heat wave, and the lack of water that is affecting us. That is basically something that you guys need to consider. I know this has not been mentioned in the original appeal, but it's something that you guys need to take into consideration. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, now we'll hear from the applicant or the representative. Patrick Jin, please press star six to unmute yourself. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, hi, this is um, Jonathan Riker. I think you, uh, Patrick Jen, he's the uh, applicant. Uh, and I'm the applicant representative. Um, and just wanted to be brief. Um, 
you know, as, as explained by the city planning department in their report uh, to the plum committee, the appellant has not produced any substantial evidence uh, to demonstrate that there will be a cumulative adverse impact caused by the project uh, in combination with the other projects they listed uh, within a, a certain radius of the project site. Um, so the, the applicant only alludes to potential impacts based on an assertion that the project site is located in a so-called high pedestrian and car traffic area, but fails to offer any analysis uh, to substantiate this assertion. assertion. Uh, this analysis is absolutely required under CEQA to make a valid um, appeal. Uh, furthermore, the applicant merely references a 2019 article uh, from the California Transit Association on declining transit ridership in Southern California uh, and suggests that any environmental impact analysis should consider this. Uh, but again, there's no analysis on his part to connect this information to a potentially significant traffic impact. Um, and we, we also wanted to mention that the applicant uh, did reach out to the appellant. Uh, prior to the appeal hearing uh, as a good faith effort to address the appellant's concerns uh, and, and, and the hope that the appeal could be dropped. Um, during this discussion, the applicant discovered that the appellant's primary concern is the displacement of tenants and the loss of affordable housing uh, due to the impact of the new project and other projects in the area. Uh, this, is, this is an important issue, uh, but unfortunately is not an issue within the purview of CEQA. Uh, also, Please note, understand that no tenants will be displaced by this project because the project site is currently vacant. Uh, furthermore, only four previously existing units on the property are subject to affordable placement pursuant to state law um, as determined by the housing department. Therefore, by adding six new affordable housing units along with the 54 new market rate units, the project is a tremendous net benefit uh, to the community. Uh, so as a result, we feel that the applicant's um, animus towards the project uh, and we urge you uh, to deny the appeal. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, do we have any comments from the council office? Yes, we do. How you doing? Um, yes. Council members, my name is Hakeem Park Davis, the planning deputy for CD10. Uh, we agree with the, the planning department's um, rebuttal to the appeal, and we ask that you deny the appeal and uphold uh, the determination for the TOC project. Excellent. Uh, if there's no further discussion, uh, Mr. Mejia, if you can read uh, instructions into the record, I'll move that we uh, deny the appeal per uh, Council District 10 in the Department of City Planning. Uh, yes, uh, Council members, is to deny the appeal filed by Enrique Velasquez of the Coalition for an Equitable Westlake MacArthur Park, and they thereby sustain the Planning Department's determination to approve the project's environmental clearance, a categorical exemption from CEQA for a Class 32 infill project for a transit-oriented communities project for the construction of a building with 16 dwelling units, including six units for extremely low-income households for a period of 55 years for the property located at 1031 through 1043 South Dewey Avenue in CD10 and as stated on the record at today's meeting by city planner, planner Michelle Carter and by CD10, Mr. Park Davis. I will call the road. Council member Harris Dawson. Yes. Council member Seville. Yes. Council member Blumenfield. Blumenfield, aye. Council member Lee. Aye. And Councilwoman Rodriguez. Uh, Councilwoman Rodriguez. Okay. So that's four mem four eyes, and it carries, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much. That takes us to item number nine. Item nine: it's categorical exemption from CEQA and the related uh, categorical exemption from CEQA and the related findings. A report from the Planning Commission and appeals filed by Nicole. Antoine and David Richardson uh, relative to the approval of environmental clearance and two, two conditional use permits and a site plan review for the construction of a mixed use development uh, with 86 residential units, 10 units for very low income households. The property is located at 3209 through, through 3327 West Sunset Boulevard in CD13. All right, we'll hear from uh, Department of City Planning. 
Hello everyone, Stephanie Escobar with City Planning. Item nine is related to an appeal of a project located at 3209 through 3227 West Sunset Boulevard within the Silver Lake Echo Park Elysian Valley Community Plan Area. The project proposes a demolition of an existing one and two story auto shop with an adjoining surface level parking lot and the construction of a new seven story mixed use residential development consisting of 86 residential units with 10 units reserved for very low income households. That's hard to um, and also, Item 10. It's actually David Blooms. Oh, okay. Someone uh, needs to go on mute. No, I'm number nine. Let's skip it. Someone oh, needs okay. to go on mute. Okay. Make sure. uh, apologies, everyone. It seems like someone was unmuted. Um, so I will continue. The, pro the project will also propose commercial ground floor. So following the City Planning Commission meeting on January 13, 2021, Two, two appeals are filed. The appeals cite issues related to California Environmental Quality Act, site plan review findings, aesthetics, and density bonus incentives and waivers. Staff has prepared a response in a letter dated September 2nd and submitted it to the council file. Additionally, I would like to address a comment regarding the project being in a high fires or severity zone. The project CEQA clearance is a categorical exemption, class 32 for an info an urban info project and therefore the high fire severity, severity impacts are not a criteria for the class 32. The comments are focused on the wildlife uh, wildlife impacts category in appendix G which are not applicable here. Uh, with that staff recommends that the plum committee recommend to the city council that they deny both appeals and determine that based on the whole of the administrative record that the project is exempt from CEQA and approve the site plan review and conditional use entitlements. Thank you and I will be available for questions. All right, uh, we'll hear from our appellants, plural, uh, on this, this appeal. Mr. Chair, the uh, appellants have not been identified, only the applicant is online. All right, we'll hear from the applicants. Daniel Friedman, please press star six to unmute yourself. Hi, good afternoon, um, honorable members of the City of Los Angeles Planning Commission. Can you hear me? This is Daniel Friedman. We can hear you. Great. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Daniel Friedman. I'm with the law office of the Jeffrey Mangles, Butler, and Mitchell. We represent the applicant, Sunset Twins-HH LLC, in this application. And um, uh, submit, basically, uh, given that there's no appellants, just to ask that this commission deny both appeals, I mean, ask the committee to deny both appeals, and to allow this project to move forward. The project was approved unanimously by the City Planning Commission, which specifically said to demolish an auto body shop and to be able to construct housing and affordable housing, that's fantastic. That's what this project provides. It's replacing an auto-oriented, car-dependent use with new housing adjacent to downtown Los Angeles, near transit, and along one of our busiest commercial boulevards, Sunset Boulevard. We think this is a great project for the city, for the Silver Lake community and for the, uh, the for the, our, our need for new housing in the city. With respect to the substance of the issues raised in the appeals, we submitted a couple letters to the record which um, are, are available for your review, which addresses all the issues. Um, just really quickly to address some of the issues. Um, first, with respect to the density bonus uh, approval, I wanna just be clear that that issue is not before this committee. This was raised in several forms with primarily with respect to this high fire zone concern. Again, this project is on Sunset Boulevard. Um, it really is not a fire issue, but even with respect to their concerns about it, that has to do with the density bonus approval, which is final um, and is not before uh, the committee. With respect to concerns over parking, um, there simply is no evidence that this project will cause any parking issues. Um, I will note that the appellant, one of the appellants at least, uh, noted that uh, several concerns over parking uh, but also stated in the same letter, I have all the private parking I need. Um, so I, I don't really understand what the concern is, nevertheless. But with that said, we've reviewed all the correspondence submitted and all the evidence submitted, and there simply is no evidence this project will create any parking impact or any traffic impact whatsoever. As I noted before, this is replacing an auto-oriented use that's existing. Uh, it,
Does that conclude uh, testimony? Correct. It does. You can confirm that. All right, and I want to make sure the appellants, uh, either Nicole Antoine or David Richardson, are um, make sure they have an opportunity to speak if they're on the line. Raise your hand and plus star six. We have one caller who has indicated that they are perhaps the uh, appellant. The last numbers are 9701. Uh, please press star six to unmute yourself. Hello. Hi. Hi. Sorry. Um, couldn't get that going there. Um, hi, council members. Uh, my name is Nicole, and I've lived in Region 2 of Silver Lake for the past decade with my family and pets. I'm appealing this project on behalf of myself and the neighborhood group Rudy, which is a responsible urban development initiative. We hope you have read our appeal thoroughly and our responses. I just submitted some supporting documents yesterday that uh, go through all the facts that we found um, and made some discoveries here. What you have is within two short blocks on Sunset Boulevard are three projects being simultaneously developed by Ride Adventures, aka Sunset Twins, aka Reno Sponsor LLC. All of these people are the same. These are the same developers. Um, they're all up for review and they're all requesting incentives and exemptions. The cumulative impact of these projects must be combined and taken under consideration as a whole. According to CEQA, approval of these projects independently of one another constitutes improper piecemealing of environmental regulation. The city needs to consider the whole of an action and require greater environmental oversight. There's no definitive rule like a city like Los Angeles needs to allow massive giveaways and certain environmental protections for the sake of the luxury housing boom, aka the housing crisis. A modicum of review must be required in the interest of public health and safety. Additionally, these plans fail to include the adequate open space. The project is located in a special grading area is inconsistent with applicable zoning designations and regulations, including the open space requirement, which is not defined in their plan. It is your obligation and duty to ensure responsible urban design. Under CEQA, for all the reasons stated above, this project does not qualify for the category of exemption. Regardless of the high fire severity zone that you mentioned before um, that they determined, Although we share the excitement for something to be um, at the site other than an auto body shop, we don't share the vision of a seven-story building as necessary to, quote, activate Sunset Boulevard simply because it is not allowed. This appeal is our way of saying we see the rules and we see the giveaways. When would the city recognize the damage that these incentives impose on our neighborhood, our character, our culture, our unhoused, our renters and homeowners, and all the stakeholders of civil aid? When does it stop? Where is the truth if not in our zoning laws, municipal code, and community plan? A full EIR must be required, and this project must be conditioned to mitigate everything that we've talked about here. Please look at the additional documents I've submitted and see that all of these projects are being piecemealed together, which is not allowed under CEQA. I thank you for your time, and we urge you to uphold the appeal for the sake of public safety and responsible development. And I'll pass it over to David. He's here. David Richardson, please press star nine to raise your virtual hands to speak for this item. Again, David Richardson, can you please press star nine to indicate that you are raising your virtual hand so that you may speak on this item. Hi, uh, this is Donald Harlan again. Hey, you know, it doesn't really matter what permit you have or what permission you get if you don't own the property. You know, if you don't own the property, none of that matters. Uh, pardon, pardon me, uh, what's your name? My name is Donald Harlan. Okay, are you a representative of Mr. Richardson? No, I'm the owner, of, I'm the real owner of the property. All I right. don't know who those people are, I've never talked to them. They've never asked me. Okay. They've never tried to pay me. Uh, okay. They're, they're, I'm they're, telling they're, you what they're doing is there is illegal. Th thank you so much. This is uh, not the moment for you to register your concerns, but thank you. Uh, all right. Um, so we've heard from the applicant. We've heard from uh, Ms. Uh, Nicole. Um, and, um, also, it does look like there's a hand up. Um, if there's a way to just check to see if that's Mr. Richardson before we proceed. Let's, uh, let's check. 
Mr. Chair, that number is for Nicole, who just spoke. Is Mr. Richardson using her line? We can check. Thanks. Hello, caller. Hi, this is Nicole. David's last four numbers are 2904, and he said he's waiting. Thank you. I see him here. Caller, please press star six to unmute yourself. Mr. David Richardson, please press star six to unmute yourself. Mr. David Richardson, the last numbers ending in 2904. Please press star six to unmute yourself. Can the city attorney please provide what are the appropriate next steps? Yeah, I'm not sure why um, this isn't working, but you have called the appellant several times. So for the record, Mr. Richardson has been given several opportunities to connect. Um, he's been identified by staff um, and given instructions to unmute himself. We are unable to hear him. So. <coughs> The chair, uh, if if you uh, want to, oh, 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 thank God! I'm sorry. I've been pressing star six and star nine for the last ten minutes. Um, sorry about that. Um, good afternoon. My name is David Richardson. I'm a 24 year resident of Silver Lake. 18 years as a homeowner behind the location of this proposed project. The issues I raised today are not NIMBYism, but environmental impact and public safety CEQA issues, unlike most irrelevant, nearly identical one minute comments made earlier. High density is required in all neighborhoods, but this project exemplifies an irrational approach to force most new density residents to park in overcrowded streets where they will drive around and around in gas powered vehicles searching for parking that isn't available, emitting increased greenhouse gases. This project has received a waiver to reduce parking from 159 spots to 69 pushing at least 90 cars onto hillside streets along with many others from related nearby projects described in our appeal, where they will dramatically decrease our air quality and create new risks for public safety in this high fire risk severity zone. Nearly all of those 90 cars will be gas powered vehicles emitting greenhouse gases and will remain gas powered vehicles because there are no charging facilities on public side streets. The city has known of the governor's EV mandate for years, a mandate that has now become California regulatory law and yet the city has willingly sat back and permitted developers to push thousands and thousands of new density vehicles onto side streets where they will remain gas powered vehicles. Harm to our air quality, increased greenhouse gas emissions and risks to our access and evacuation routes in this high fire risk severity zone are CEQA issues. CEQA remains the law in California and is a tool that the city must use to protect our residents from further damage. Erasing interior parking does not eliminate gas-powered cars, but reinforces the need for them, as residents will have nowhere else to charge an EV vehicle. This isn't just our future, our air quality, and our fire safety. This is also your legacy. Given the EV mandate, the city must treat new density parking as an environmental issue, and the time to adopt that approach is now. There may be no better example of a project that demands a sequel review than this one. Most of its residents will be forced to park on side streets with no charging facilities, and it has erased the municipal code's protections for high fire risk severity zones by cynically renaming impermissible incentives as permitted so-called waivers, increasing the risk to public safety. 
The only substantial evidence you need to require a secret review is that this project is pouring 90 cars into hillside streets where there are no charging facilities and where they will emit greenhouse gases to further undermine the city's ability to meet the intent and purpose of the EV mandate. CEQA is your tool to fix these issues, and the time to start using it is now. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Richardson. That was uh, worth the wait. Uh, do we have any uh, updates from the council office on this item? Good afternoon. This is Craig Bullock with Councilmember Mitch O'Farrell's office. Um, the planning department has adequately addressed the rebuttals to the appeal points that were made. And while sympathetic to the um, residents' arguments, they do not meet the legal threshold. And therefore, we um, advise that you go with the recommendations made by the planning department to deny the appeals. Thank you. Uh, all right, uh, Mr. Mejia, we have uh, instructions to deny this appeal or these appeals. Uh, if you could read those instructions, we'll get a second and uh, call the roll. Okay, to deny the appeals filed by Nicole, Antoine, and David Richardson, thereby sustain the Planning Commission's approval of two conditional use permits and a site plan review for the construction of a new mixed use residential development consisting of 86 residential units, 10 units reserved for very low income households, properties located at 3209 through 3327. West Sunset Boulevard and as stated on the record at today's meeting by Mr. Craig Bullock from CD13 and the city planner. I will call the roll. Council Member Harris Dawson. Yes. Council Member Cedillo. Yes. Council Member Blumenfield. Blumenfield, aye. Council Member Lee. Aye. And Councilwoman Rodriguez. That's uh, four members and it carries, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much. That takes us to item number 10. Item 10 is a sustainable communities environmental assessment, the errata and the CEQA findings, the mitigation measures, mitigation monitoring program, and a report from planning as to the construction of a mixed use building with 242 units, 25 units reserved for extremely low income households, properties located in CD5. All right, we'll hear from uh, Department of City Planning on this item. Uh, hi, this is David with City Planning. I'll be presenting a SCIA or Sustainable Communities Environmental Assessment as the environmental clearance for this project involving the construction of a new eight-story mixed use building with 242 residential units and ground floor commercial space located at 5001 Wilshire Boulevard. Uh, the project will reserve 10% or 25 units for extremely low income households and will develop a privately maintained publicly accessible open space area. The proposed project is contingent upon the approval of the following entitlements, uh, TLC, a site plan review, clarification of acute condition, as well as a vesting tentative track map. These entitlements are not being considered here today or by the city council. Uh, what is being considered is the SCIA. Uh, similar to an MND, an initial study was drafted and published for public comment. The scale was published in April and the public comment period ran until mid-May for a period of 30 days. As detailed in the SCIA and staff report to Plum dated August 31st, 2022, the project will not result in a significant effect on the environment. The SCIA determined that the project is a transit priority project and will incorporate all mitigation measures and criteria in SCAG's Regional Transportation Plan and Sustainable Community Strategy, ERR, and the Wilshire, uh, the Wilshire Community Plan Transportation Improvement and Mitigation Program, uh, that all the potentially significant effects required to be studied in the initial study have been identified and analyzed in this SCIA, and that, the mitigation, and that a mitigation monitoring and reporting program was drafted that includes mitigation measures which will reduce potentially significant environmental impacts. Uh, these mitigation uh, measures address potential impacts to cultural resources, tribal cultural resources, geology and soils, and noise. Um, in addition to the SCIA, I request that the committee also consider an errata to the SCIA, a response to public comments submitted by the applicant, and an updated mitigation monitoring and reporting program. These documents have been transmitted into the council file and address technical corrections, clarifications, and comments received during the public comment period. 
Uh, these documents do not include any significant changes to the project or environmental setting, nor identify any substantial adverse environmental effects or feasible uh, mitigation measures. Therefore, planning staff recommends that Plum recommend for City Council action for the adoption of the SCIA, the errata dated August 2022, and the mitigation monitoring and reporting program. Uh, this concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a representative from Council District 5. Yes, uh, good afternoon, Dylan Tig with Councilmember Kretz's office. Thank you for the opportunity to provide comments on this project today. The council member believes that the proposed project will bring many benefits to the community through affordable and market rate housing, as well as the expansion of the publicly accessible open space at the rear of the site. Council member Kretz would like to see the SCIA approved uh, and allowed to move forward in the process. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. If there are no questions or comments from members of the committee, We've heard from Council District 5 um, and the Department of City Planning. And with that, I'm gonna move that we approve uh, the environmental clearance in the SCIA. Second. Uh, seconded by Mr. Cedillo uh, with specific instructions to be read into the record by Mr. Mejia, followed by a roll call. Yes, to approve the environmental clearance, the Sustainable Communities Environmental Assessment, SCIA, the findings, the RADA, to the SCIA, the mitigation measures, the mitigated monitoring program, uh, mitigated monitoring and reporting program contained in the planning department report dated April 13, 2022. Inasmuch as much as the proposed mixed use project is a transit priority project and thereby exempt from CEQA pursuant to public resources code sections 21155 and 21155.2 and as stated on the record at today's meeting, by city planner David Wound and by uh, CD5, Mr. Dillon City. I will call the roll. Council member, uh, excuse me, Council member Marquise Harris Dawson. Yes. Council member Cedillo. Yes. Council member Blumenfield. Aye. Council member Lee. Aye. And Councilwoman Rodriguez. Uh, that's four ayes and it carries, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Mejia, can you confirm that that concludes our regular business for today? It does, sir. It concludes our Excellent. Regular. With that, we are adjourned. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you.